So welcome and um, it is a pleasure to uh, welcome you to our panel today. My name is Dan Bernstein and um, as of just two and a half months ago, I am the Associate Dean for Medical Curriculum and Scholarship. After the recent events in Florida, we heard that one of our sister medical schools had informed its students that it was not, um, it was not in the school's purview to discuss gun violence um, and that they should not demonstrate in their white coats because that was, um, that was really not um, their role as physicians. I, I, I disagree most heartily with that and I think uh, all of us in the Dean's office and I think most of us in the faculty do as well. Our mission is health policy and health pre and prevention and providing a better healthy environment for all of our patients and our communities and we take that role very seriously. As part of that role is research. Through research, we have cut the number of deaths due to tobacco-related diseases dramatically in this country. We have enacted policies that have reduced automobile accident deaths. Um, but as you'll hear today, we're, we're, our hands are cuffed in terms of research on one of the other major traumatic causes of death in this country, and that is uh, gun injuries and gun violence. So our mission is education here today. Um, it is to provide a panel of experts to talk about the legal, the ethical, the medical, the financial consequences of gun violence in the U.S. We also have a diverse community at Stanford. And the solutions to gun violence are complex. There are many ideas ranging from banning guns to banning some form of guns to allowing teachers to be armed in schools. And many of us have very heartfelt and very strong opinions. One of the other missions of a medical school is to encourage and foster dialogue. And I don't think there is any way we are going to move forward on an issue as politically charged as, as this one without learning how to discuss with our colleagues and our friends and our communities. Um, and so hopefully we can use this forum as a first step forward in engaging in that dialogue. I'd like to read a statement from Dean Miner who apologizes that he was unable to be here today. He writes, Stanford is committed to ensuring a safe and welcoming environment. Our community only gets safer when it comes together to proclaim our shared values. The horrific events across our country from Parkland, Florida, and too many other schools nationwide, to the Yountville shooting in which former Stanford trainee Jennifer Gonzalez tragically perished, must not be repeated. We must find a way to protect the most basic of human rights, the right to live, learn, and work in a safe environment. I commend you all for your advocacy. You make Stanford proud. I regret that my schedule does not permit me to be there in person, but know that I am with you in spirit. It is the same spirit that moved so many of you earlier today to march to or later today, I guess, to show your solidarity. I truly hope that this period in history will be remembered by how the nation came together to finally address the epidemic of violence in our country and to say never again. At times like this, I am reminded again of the great strength of the Stanford community. Thank you for having the vision to see and the courage to work toward a better and safer world. Thank you, Dean Miner, for those wonderful words and sentiment. So I'd like to introduce um, our session uh, moderator, uh, a, a colleague, former trainee of mine, and, and, and a very good friend, Dr. Lee Sanders. Lee is the chief of the Division of General Pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics um, and has long worked um, both in the community as well as his research focus on issues of public health related to children, including all forms of violence, including gun violence. Um, we also, as he'll tell you, has a personal connection to the events that recently transpired in Florida. So without uh, further words from me, let me introduce Dr. Lee Sanders.
Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. And thank you for, for all of you in the community for, for joining us. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm aware of the, of the optics here. We have one of our first speakers is actually from UCSF. But what I want to point out is that this is really a communal response to learning more about gun violence. This is not something that is within institutions. It's cross-institutional. Uh, um, a few words about this panel today. Um, we're very lucky to have um, some regional experts experts in uh, gun-related uh, 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 injury research and advocacy. Um, and the purpose of today's forum is to examine gun injuries in the context of public health, and particularly a public health issue that disproportionately affects children, adolescents, and young adults in low-income and ethnic minority communities. Our overarching goals are two. One, to inform one another about what we know and perhaps what we don't know about gun-related injury. And number two, to discuss opportunities for healthcare professionals to address gun-related injury through prevention, treatment, research, and public policy. First, we will hear from each of our panelists with perspectives from public health, trauma medicine, economics, law, and prevention. Then we will hear from you. We have solicited questions in advance from some of the students and faculty, and we welcome your questions here in this room. For those of you who are joining us uh, uh, remotely, I understand this is being live streamed. Um, please consider joining us in person. There is coffee and bagels in the back, so that's another reason to join us here, uh, as well as to interact in person or, or online with your questions. Uh, we aim to close this session by a, uh, around 11.40 to allow for a planned walkout, in, as Dan mentioned, in solidarity with students nationwide at other medical schools and also at high schools in memory of the victims of the mass shooting at a high school in Parkland, Florida last month. And now on to some introductions. Um, this panel is both professional and personal for me, as well as those in this panel. Professional because we conduct research or advance advocacy that aims in part to reduce the morbidity and mortality from gun violence. And personal because many of us have cared for patients or have had family members who have been injured or affected by gun violence. As Dan mentioned, I'm a general pediatrician and chief of the Division of General Pediatrics here, where I take care of children and families from our neighboring low-income communities. I conduct research to address child health disparities, including an NIH-funded randomized controlled trial of an intervention founded by the American Academy of Pediatrics to address child injury prevention, including gun safety. And I grew up in Sunrise, Florida, around the corner from Parkland, Florida, where my cousin is currently a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Our panelists represent um, a spectrum of our local community and research. First, we're going to hear from Jahan Fahimi, who is Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at UCSF and trained at Highland Hospital in Oakland, and last year co-authored a National Emergency Medicine Agenda for Firearms Injury Research. We'll then hear from Lisa Knowlton, who is Assistant Professor of Surgery at Stanford, where she is a lead member of the trauma surgery team and a public health and global surgery advocate working to ensure safe surgery and improved access to care. Sarah Beth Spitzer will be our highlight uh, of the panel. She is a third-year medical student here at Stanford whose Med Scholars pro Research Project resulted in a manuscript in the American Journal of Public Health documenting the societal economic burden of gun-related injuries, including the fact that greater than 40% of that burden is covered by public payers. David Stutter is professor of law at Stanford with a joint appointment in medicine and health policy. He is a leading expert in the field of health law and empirical legal research, including a recent manuscript last year documenting the impact of mass shootings on subsequent handgun acquisitions in California. And finally, Michelle Sandberg, a fellow general pediatrician at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, a fellow Floridian as well, um, and a national leader for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, an advocacy organization that was founded in the wake of the Newtown school shootings. So first, Jahan, if you'll come up, will give us some framing of farm, firearm violence in the context of public health. Thanks, Jahan. Right. Um, so each of our presenters will be presenting first, and then we'll have some Q&A afterwards. Well, um, I'd like to start by saying thank you. Um, 
Uh, mostly, I'd like to say thank you for organizing a day like today, um, for putting on an event like this, and, and thank you for letting me be a part of it. Um, I mean, I'm from UCSF. I know that's not Berkeley, but I thought by like association, I might be excluded from coming down here. Um, but you guys all seem really nice. It's, um, so um, I'd like to kind of, it's not lost on me that what you guys are doing today is not necessarily easy. Um, and I, it, it, as I was putting together the slides, it sort of this quote came to my mind, and I thought it was worth starting with this. It's a quote from the German anthropologist, physician, author, Rudolf Furkow, who says that if medicine is to really accomplish its great task, it must intervene in political and social life. It must point out the hindrances that impede the normal social functioning of vital processes and affect their removal. And I love this quote because it tells me that to be a successful physician, um, to be a successful academic, you kind of have to practice beyond just medicine. You have to be an activist. You have to be a politician. And that's really what we're doing here. What Stanford has done today is said, collectively, we're going to make a statement, a social statement, a political statement. And that's not easy. It'd be a lot easier to just do nothing and to kind of ignore this. But to actively make a statement, I think, is incredibly important. And you should just be really proud of that. Um, a little bit about myself, I have no conflicts, I have no financial disclosures. Um, I um, became interested in this topic um, about five, six years ago, um, right around the same time as Sandy Hook, in fact, because of Sandy Hook. And um, I suspect that a lot of other people came onto the scene from, from medicine and public health because of this event. It's incredibly emotional to have uh, watched the news about all these first graders who were murdered. Um, and so it, in me, it inspired me to say, I think I, I have a, a certain amount of expertise. Uh, perhaps I have a certain amount of moral authority in my community, and I can leverage that to talk about, something, uh, about, about how to do something about this issue. But the irony in all of that is because this event that occurred 3,000 miles away um, is an outlier. It's incredibly rare. Um, yet, you know, I'm working in Oakland at the time, and I've taken care of hundreds upon hundreds of shooting victims. And then this is what motivates me to say I want to do something about it. And it's really ironic. Um, I don't know. I'm just trying to be honest about how I arrived at this. Um, but I think it, it, it reminds me to sort of go back and say, if we're going to talk about firearms, we really need to know what we're talking about. Because the mass violence um, definitely dominates the headlines, and it pulls us in. But that's not the real scope of the problem. And if you wanted to have a discussion around what is the scope of firearm violence, you have to tackle the numerator denominator problem. So are we talking about injuries or are we talking about deaths? Are we talking about homicides or are we talking about suicides? And I will argue that you cannot have this discussion if you're not willing to have the racial discussion. Um, there are obviously a lot of other stratifications you can make, different ways to think about the issue. But I would say these three, at the very minimum, sort of get us to a place of really kind of understanding the scope in a, in a much more nuanced way. And so I'll try and go through that a little bit. So let's talk about casualties overall, injuries and deaths. If you look at the etiology, homicide and assault um, accounts for the overwhelming number of casualties in the United States. Right? Followed by suicide and attempted suicide. There's a decent number of accidental injuries. And I put here police shootings just for scale because, again, that dominates headlines. And I'm not saying it shouldn't, but it, you know, in the grand scheme of firearm injuries and deaths, it's relatively small. But what you can see is if, if you look at just the death component, suicide really is the story of firearm violence in America. So a lot more homicide, uh, sorry, a lot more assaults, but, but relatively fewer deaths as compared to suicide. And so if we just kind of flip the denominator and say, let's look at the deaths um, by each one of these etiologies. So let's look at homicides in general and what proportion of those are related to firearms. 
you see that 70% of the 15,000 homicides a year, 16,000 homicides a year, are, uh, have a firearm implicated in them. But again, suicide is a much bigger issue in the United States. 42,000, 43,000 suicides every year, and half of them are executed by a, by a firearm. So what it tells you is that relatively speaking, um, in the case of homicide, firearms are uh, implicated in more instances, but overall deaths, even though it's a, it's a smaller proportion of overall deaths, overall the deaths by firearms are driven by suicides. And if we collapse those, this is what it looks like. About two-thirds of deaths in the United States are from suicide. So when someone says firearms violence is a mental health issue, it absolutely is, but not for the reason that people are making that argument, right? So let's put these 33,594 uh, firearm deaths per year into some sort of scope with respect to other diseases that we think and care a lot about. So firearms are implicated somewhere in about, somewhere between prostate cancer and sepsis with respect to the number of deaths annually. What's striking about this list to me though is how much time, energy, research, funding, advocacy we spend on all these other diseases. I mean, think about sepsis. Just in my career, the entire paradigm of how we think about sepsis, how we treat patients with potential sepsis, has completely transformed. We, we're spending billions of dollars on research. We have campaigns. We've changed the way we practice liver disease and cirrhosis. Think about the amount of drug development that's occurred with respect, with respect to hepatitis, motor vehicle accidents. We have shaved off so many deaths from from traffic accidents in the last few decades by making safer cars, safer roads. Alcohol, I mean, we have an entire NIH institute dedicated to alcohol. So, but by comparison, firearms doesn't get nearly the same amount of scientific or medical attention. It gets a lot of public uh, press, but not the same amount of attention from our community. And I'll come back to why in just a little bit. But I do want to come back to the notion of you can't have this conversation if you're not willing to talk about race. Um, and there's a lot to be said about this topic. We could fill up an entire hour. But this one slide, I think, just kind of gives you the tip of the iceberg and summarizes it nicely. When black people die from guns, it's homicide. When white people die from guns, it's suicide. It's just an important healthcare disparity to understand, and I think if you're planning interventions to try and reduce gun injury and gun death, you have to consider the, the racial stratification for your target population. So I'm going to transition a little bit to this uh, matrix. Um, this was the matrix that we in the American College of Phys Emergency Physicians used to put together a position statement around what the research agenda needs to be moving forward to, to address gun violence, at least from the emergency medicine standpoint. And what we decided is that we have these sort of ecologies of violence, criminal violence, intimate partner violence, self-harm, mass violence, accidental injuries, which is not really violence, but it's a, it's a form of injury, and then legal intervention or police shootings. And then there's these various healthcare domains that we need to be thinking about. The medical management of these patients, which we're actually quite good at, um, mental and psychological care, uh, the risk assessment and screening of patients for each one of these ecologies, and then primary and secondary prevention. And I put this matrix out there just to sort of give you a sense that, again, if you want to talk about this issue, you have to be able to know which cell in this matrix you're operating in so that you can really do a deeper dive. Now, many of those cells don't have very much data. We don't know very much about, say, um, how do you how you do primary screening for uh, criminal violence and and uh, youth peer to peer violence? Um, why is the epidemiology of firearms violence lacking? Anybody? Dickey. The Dickey Amendment. So this graph is is uh, kind of tells tells the history of w what happened, and I'll come back to the Dickey Amendment. The bars there are the um, 
sorry, let's look at the dotted red line. That's the total number of academic publications in millions from 1960 to 2010. You can see this steep rise. We as a, as a, as a discipline, as a, as in the House of Medicine, have gotten really good at publishing research. And the bars represent publications about firearms and violence per million publications overall. And you can see that we weren't doing very much, and then somewhere in the mid-80s, when handguns became incredibly, you know, came onto the scene, we started doing a lot of research. And right around the mid-90s, that dropped off dramatically. We peaked right there in the mid-90s. And I don't have the time to go into this in great detail, but I, I love this analogy. If you go back to 1950 and you look at the British Medical Journal, um, this is the original study that drew the connection between smoking and lung cancer. It's a case control study. It's kind of a landmark study at this point. And it basically said, hey, among smokers, there's a higher incidence of lung cancer. It's like it was the perfect, perfect case control study example. Well, in 1993, Art Kellerman published a case control study in um, the New England Journal of Medicine that basically said if you have a gun in the home, you're more likely to be injured by it. And the response to this article being published, Art at the time was being funded by the CDC, was uh, Jay Dickey introducing um, an amendment into the uh, 97 um, funding bill that basically said that none of the funds made available for injury and prevention control at the, at the CDC may be used to advocate or promote gun control. And that next year, the exact line, amount, line item amount that was being spent on firearms research, which a lot of it was going to Art Kellerman, was cut. And at that point, um, our Congress um, sort of doubled down and said, we are just not going to fund it in the NIH. We're not going to fund it anywhere. And no one will go anywhere near uh, the funding for firearms violence because of the worry of the, of, of the backlash from the NRA. So I'm going to stop there, um, but you know we can talk a little bit more about this as, as part of the panel. Despite the lack of research funding, the, f the fact that we, we cut the funding off in the mid-90s and we've had two decades of just this gap in our understanding of the epidemiology of firearms, it doesn't mean we don't know anything. We, we have some direct, we have some indirect evidence, and we have common sense. And I think that's part of the reason why we're here, is because we're, we've, we've sort of realized that as, as a specialty, as a, a medicine in general, it's time for us to throw our weight around a little bit and to apply a little bit of our own common sense. So look forward to talking with you guys more about this. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Lisa Knowlton, who, as I mentioned, is an assistant professor here in surgery. So if we can set up her slides. So thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak on this incredibly important topic. Uh, it's obviously been an area of clinical interest uh, to me uh, from the time that I decided to become a trauma and critical care surgeon. And I also had the opportunity fairly early in my training while completing my Master of Public Health to learn from one of the great leaders in research uh, in this area, Dr. David uh, Hemingway at Harvard, who's really uh, done wonders to advance the field of gun violence research in our country. So just as a uh, just a warning or a, a word of caution, there are a few graphic images in this presentation. Uh, they're not included for shock value, but more to convey the sheer magnitude of devastation that can be caused by these types of penetrating injuries. So I'll just start by saying that as trauma surgeons, we like to think that we are prepared for anything. On any given day, we may see patients who have been severely injured by motor vehicle collisions, uh, who suffer from bad mechanical falls, who have been poor, uh, badly burned, or even those who have been stabbed. Out of all these injuries, there are few as devastating and unpredictable as those inflicted by firearms. 
So in terms of penetrating injuries, uh, gunshot wounds are in fact less common than stabbings, but they do carry a higher mortality due to the greater energy transmitted through tissues. In terms of abdominal injury, which is the most common site of injury from firearms, um, abdominal injury from gunshot wounds accounts for up to 90% of mortality associated with penetrating abdominal injuries. Mortality for isolated abdominal gunshot wounds is approximately 10%, and the most commonly injured organs are going to be the small bowel, liver, colon, and often multiple injuries at one time. When we talk about mechanism of injury and how um, bullets inflict, uh, inflict wounds on a patient, you have the direct wounding capability of the bullet itself directly related to its kinetic energy. And then in addition to that, uh, not only is there damage caused by the passage of the missile, but there's a secondary shock wave that occurs that can create often a very large cavitating wound. There's, of course, an exponential increase in injury with increasing velocity and efficiency of energy transfer depending on the weapon use. And it's important to note that even without direct impact, some bullets can be strong enough to inflict fractures on adjacent bone. Ultimately, it comes down to the distance uh, between the shooter and the patient and the trajectory of the bullet, which we often have to tease out in the trauma bay in order to determine the extent of injury. So when we talk about low and high velocity weapons, uh, it goes without saying that the extent of damage inflicted by a lower velocity handgun uh, can be quite different uh, than much higher velocity weapons such as a shotgun or a semi-automatic um, weapon. And then in terms of the ammunition use, we need to consider things such as how many bullets a magazine can hold and how rapidly they can be fired uh, and how many shots uh, have been fired at the uh, victim. And then in terms of the bullet itself, uh, there are solid full metal jacket bullets uh, that are meant to cause deep penetrating injury and penetrate through hard surfaces such as bone versus hollow point bullets uh, that on impact create a mushroom effect and are much scarier um, for people treating uh, victims of shootings because they can have widespread uh, injuries and uh, induce pellets throughout the body. So I'm going to take you into the uh, trauma bay where uh, Emergency physicians, nurses, and trauma surgeons typically re receive patients uh, who have been victims of uh, shootings. So this is your typical trauma-based setup. And I'll walk you through a brief case of a 19-year-old male uh, who comes in with multiple gunshot wounds to the face, chest, abdomen, and extremities. All that you know uh, that is that en route he's been hypotensive and tachycardiac. So what do we do next? Well, the first thing that we do is to assemble a team. In so much as we can prepare for an event like this, uh, we assemble our team of emergency physicians, trauma surgeons, students, residents, nurses, uh, techs, adjunct personnel, and we all adopt our own uh, universal precautions in order to ensure our own safety. So masks, uh, gloves, gown, um, eyewear to protect ourselves. And then one of the most important things in terms of the preparation step is to have every uh, additional resource at your disposal aware of the patient who's arriving. So we would call up to the operating room and say that we're likely going to be coming up with a patient who's a gunshot uh, victim. We would call the lab uh, and uh, blood bank to be ready for massive transfusion. And we would also have x-ray available because many times we do not have uh, the luxury of time to obtain CT scans on these patients. So simple x-rays done in the trauma bay can help us uh, determine how many bullets are in the patient, uh, wound trajectories, et cetera, before rushing them to the operating room. So now the patient arrives uh, to the trauma bay. Uh, they're on a long board with a cervical spine collar because um, you know, even though this is not a blunt mechanism of injury, oftentimes the trajectory may cross the spinal cord uh, and we can't uh, guarantee uh, after, until after we've performed a thorough assessment uh, that the patient has not um, had a, some type of spinal injury. 
So the next step, uh, very similar to the way in which we approach advanced cardiac life support, uh, trauma patients uh, undergo advanced trauma life support. So the primary survey is crucial in these patients. We go through the same ABCDE mechanism, uh, ensuring airway, breathing, and circulation before we move on to anything else. So in a patient who has potentially been shot in the face or the neck, securing the airway is of utmost importance. Um, they may have a compromised airway because of blood and tissue damage, uh, so we would rapidly move to intubate that patient or potentially secure a surgical airway. The same goes if a patient's level of consciousness because of extreme blood loss is less than eight or if they have so much agitation that it's in fact uh, preventing a proper examination. In terms of breathing, breath sounds are something that uh, can be quite difficult to elicit in a very noisy trauma base, so we're looking for equal bilateral uh, chest expansion, and if there's any question of the bullet having passed uh, through the chest, uh, there's a high likelihood that there will be a collapsed lung or blood in the chest cavity, and we often, as a security measure, will place bilateral chest tubes in the trauma bay uh, to examine for these things. And then in terms of circulation, uh, we often talk about five main sites of life-threatening bleeding. That can be in the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis, the extremities. The femur can hold up to one and a half liters of blood loss, and it's often something that's not visible or that you would suspect uh, from the naked eye. And then the last one is blood loss onto the floor from an exsanguinating wound. So some of the basic principles, uh, even you know, for, for all of us uh, trained physicians, are just to obtain intravenous access, to start uh, massive transfusion protocol, and to do anything you can in terms of applying pressure, tourniquets, or splints to control bleeding until the patient goes to the operating room. The remainder of the exam uh, it, is associated with ensuring uh, that the patient doesn't have any major neurological findings, thoroughly exposing them so that we could examine for entry and exit wounds and try to determine the trajectory of the bullet before going to the operating room. That's often assisted, as I mentioned, by chest x-ray and pelvic x-ray. And then here we have uh, a few images, so this is for example, someone who was uh, shot in the face and who required uh, placement of a surgical airway. And so if you had an x-ray like this where you see multiple bullets in the chest and abdomen, uh, this is certainly someone who would need to be uh, rushed immediately to the operating room. This is unfortunately the gruesome scene that uh, we often uh, are left with uh, when the patient leaves the trauma bay and is being wheeled emergently up to the operating room. So as you can see, uh, quite a devastating scene. The next more challenging uh, part for the trauma surgeon and anesthesiologist is uh, operative planning, uh, how we're going to optimize resuscitation of this type of patient, um, minimize any additional blood loss, and as we see, if somebody's shot in the chest or abdomen, there are a number of extremely vital structures that can be hit, uh, the most concerning of which are the inferior vena cava in blue and the abdominal aorta in red. So oftentimes what we would do is perform a midline abdominal incision that could easily be extended up into the chest, and this frequently requires vascular control uh, for loss of bleeding either above or below the diaphragm. So some of the main principles in the operating room are to control bleeding, any spillage, repair injuries versus damage control surgery. Unfortunately, things never look as pretty as the uh, diagrams that I showed previously, and this is often what we encounter in the operating room, uh, dead bowel, um, badly injured extremities. and. Frequently, more frequently than not, uh, what we end up doing is something called damage control surgery. So we do the minimum required to control contamination and pack bleeding in order to get the patient to the intensive care unit uh, so that they can be better resuscitated. And then we'll bring them back for subsequent surgery that's more definitive. This is a temporary abdominal uh, wound closure that we frequently place uh, before uh, sending the patient to the ICU. 
And I just wanted to uh, highlight this quote uh, from an article from the Huffington Post in 2017. Uh, the last line, the reality is that when people get shot and if they're going to survive, and as we've seen, many uh, patients who are victims of assault often do survive, that's when the real suffering begins. Um, you know, I think the main thing for these patients is that they're subject to multiple repeated surgeries, uh, prolonged lengths of stay in the hospital, additional complications, lengthy rehab stays, uh, loss of work, uh, depression, mental health issues, PTSD, um, you know, loss of uh, financial productivity. Uh, so the impact can really be very devastating even uh, if they do manage to leave the hospital alive. And I'll just end on um, this Stop the Bleed campaign, which actually was spawned by the American College of Surgeons in conjunction with the military, the Hartford Consensus. Uh, this was also um, kind of born out of the Sandy Hook uh, events, and it's a... Um, national and international campaign to train uh, the public and non-medical people uh, in the field how to stop bleeding by applying pressure, tourniquets. We've had enormous success here at Stanford, UCSF, um, other universities and hospitals throughout the country in implementing uh, this campaign. We've reached out to schools, um, churches, companies done training. So please feel free to contact me if you want to uh, learn more about this initiative and uh, we can uh, help provide some outreach into the community. Thank you very much. Lisa, thanks so much. Uh, next, we're going to hear, so clearly we're spanning the gamut between public health framing and, and some of the clinical imperatives. We're next going to hear from Sarah Beth Spitzer, uh, one of our medical students. Um, Margaret, if you can help with the slides, um, who will be talking about the um, social and economic impact of gun violence. Apparently, it's easier for medical students to get food. So if anyone was wondering why I was the highlight, that's, that's why. <laughs> so there are many ways to think about the economic costs of firearm violence in society, uh, most importantly of which is the tragedy of lost and injured lives. Um, but the economic costs are just one way that this complicated issue can be used uh, to estimate the impact of gun violence in the United States. The economic costs of firearms can be broken down in multiple ways. There are costs to individuals, uh, such as lost income to victims who are unable to continue working in their previous jobs, or to family members who may become full-time caregivers. Individuals also incur costs for healthcare appointments, hospital admissions, physical therapy, and medical supplies that become essential to everyday life. There may be legal or mental health fees that need to be paid. And as Dr. Knowlton just alluded to, uh, you'll note that most of these costs actually come after the initial gunshot injury. Economic costs can also be uh, occurred, can also occur at a larger societal level. So one metric used to measure these costs are the decrease in GDP from the entirely lost or decreased potential of an often otherwise young, healthy individual in society. There are costs of police investigations and preventative security measures. Um, there are costs of public defense, emergency medical responders, ambulances, and other medical transportation. Another way of viewing these costs are direct versus indirect costs. Direct costs include those directly borne from injury, such as medical fees and emergency responders. Indirect costs include losses to employers or impact on quality of life. There are a broad way, spectrum of ways that we can calculate costs, and this makes it difficult to agree on one true economic cost of firearm injuries. Which costs are included and how these costs are calculated vary dramatically among different studies. This means there are often extremely wide ranges of values presented when discussing firearm costs. Some studies focus on specific costs of these categories. Work loss from firearm injuries has been estimated to cost 48, uh, between 46 and $48 billion. Uh, and the cost of placing additional guards in schools, for example, has been estimated to cost $3.6 billion annually. Other studies claim to calculate the overarching cost of firearm injuries. 
One source, the Children's Safety Network, calculated the cost to be $174 billion annually. However, a largely cited source, a 2015 Mother Jones study, found that the annual cost exceeded $229 billion. So what do these studies include and how do they calculate these costs? And how do we begin to make sense of numbers that differ by almost $100 billion? Let's take a look at the Mother Jones study. They broke down costs into direct and indirect costs, including both. They found direct costs to total $6.8 billion and indirect costs to total $221 billion. Direct costs included police response, emergency transport, hospital fees, family health fees, court fees, and the expenses for prison sentences of those indicted for homicide or assault. Prison sentences were actually the single largest contributor to direct costs at $5.2 billion. Indirect costs included lost wages and productivity, along with lost quality of life. They estimated lost wages and productivity to cost $49 billion, and lost quality of life to cost $169 billion. The Children's Safety Network excluded some of these indirect costs, explaining how they came to such drastically different estimates. The costs included raise important and often subjective questions. Are prison sentences a true cost of firearm injuries or possibly more representative of an underlying issue within the legal system? Is it even possible to put an accurate dollar estimate on the effects of witnessing a shooting in your school or hometown or on the impact that a gunshot might have on someone's quality of life? These questions are difficult to answer, but important to understanding the true impact that gun violence has in the United States. Beyond deciding which cost to calculate, the specific methods of each of these studies varies greatly. The cost data itself is hard, if not impossible, to acquire, and it might not even exist at all. The more indirect the costs, the more difficult it becomes to calculate them in a standardized fashion. Why, though, does it even matter to calculate these costs in a reliable way, when no matter how these numbers are broken down, they're astronomical? In order to have a true impact, it's important that these numbers resonate with those individuals who, at the end of the day, are responsible for paying for these costs. How much of these costs are borne by taxpayers and the U.S. government? Are they borne equally? If not, which taxpayers are paying more and by how much? Parsing out these details is impossible without fundamentally strong data underlying these calculations. As a first-year medical student interested in trauma surgery, I wanted to pursue firearms research that could contribute to public health policy making. As I worked with the trauma team to determine where we could have an impact, we were surprised by how little peer-reviewed data there was on the cost of these injuries, despite there being such a widely discussed and debated topic. My Med Scholars project became devoted to calculating the medical costs of firearm injuries in the United States. Even this, we found, could be broken down into many subcategories. Based on available, reliable data sets, we decided to focus only on the initial inpatient hospitalization for firearm injuries. These costs exclude emergency department costs, outpatient medical treatment, rehabilitation, and hospital readmissions, among others. We found that the cost of only the initial hospitalization was approximately $730 million annually accounting for almost $6.6 .6 billion between 2006 and 2014. Over 40% of these costs fell on government insurance and another 25% on the uninsured. Since this study, we and others have expanded research to calculate the hospital readmission costs, finding that readmissions cost an additional $100 million annually. We aim to continue to explore the true medical cost of firearm injuries, such as emergency room visits and long-term rehabilitation costs. We hope that the incredible scale of these numbers will continue to motivate funding in this area, which we've already heard is very limited. The more reliable and transparent the data, the more informed public health decisions can be. I hope that medical professionals will continue to use their position in society to play an informed role in this critical discussion. I would like to thank Dr. Lee and Dr. Bernstein for the opportunity to present in this panel, um, as well as Dr. Spain, Dr. Weiser, and Dr. Stoudemire and the rest of the trauma team for their support and their research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah Beth. Phenomenal work um, for the students here. See what med scholars can do for you. 
um, get involved in that. Uh, Margaret, if you can set up the slides, I believe David Studdard is next. David uh, has, I mentioned before, a joint appointment in the School of Law as well as the School of Medicine here and is internationally recognized for his work in firearm violence. Um, and his country of origin is Australia. So I don't know if we'll be able to talk a little bit later, now or later about what Australia has done. I'm happy to talk about Australia. I'm still trying to get over Lisa's slides here, so I'm a little unsteady. Um, I, I, I don't have any such images, maybe a couple of statutes that I might show. Some people find that disturbing, but, but nothing, nothing compared to Lisa's presentation. That was really incredibly powerful. So, you know, just in a few minutes, it's hard to kind of sketch out the, the legal context. Um, but what I thought I might do is just sort of talk to you a little bit about how I think about uh, this gigantic slew of firearm regulation we have in the United States. Um, uh, the, first, the first thing to recognize is that, um, uh, you know, it's federalism at work. Uh, so we have a mix of federal, state, and even local laws that make up the rules that govern firearms in the United States. So it's not easy to explain or navigate, and it's going to depend on where you are. When you look at the sort of smorgasbord of uh, types of laws that are out there, um, it's really quite vast. So, so this is a graphic that I think hopefully helps to sort of sort the, the, the main types of laws you read about in the newspapers into a few buckets. Um, so so begin, and generally the buckets are sort of organised around what the laws are supposed to do. So if we start with um, uh, rules around who can have a gun, this bucket includes um, rules around background checks, uh, minimum age requirements for purchasing uh, prohibited persons who can and can't both buy a gun and possess a gun. Uh, that's a very active area of regulation at the state level. Uh, how guns are sold. Um, who can sell guns? What, what, what is required to be a so-called federally licensed dealer of firearms? Um, uh, what are the rules that govern gun shows and person-to-person -person transfers of firearms, waiting periods, uh, how frequently we can buy guns. Uh, uh, in California, we have a one handgun a, a month rule. Uh, other states have similar rules. Some states have no rules uh, in that regard. There's a set of laws that place requirements on gun owners. Uh, a few states, three states, uh, require licensing. Uh, to, to own a firearm, you, you must have a license. Um, there are registration systems. Uh, California is unique in having a gun safety training program as a requirement uh, of owning a handgun. Uh, and a number of states uh, impose responsibilities on firearm owners to report thefts. 250,000 guns a year in the United States are stolen. Uh, many of them, uh, a substantial number of them, then used in crimes. So uh, gun theft is a, is a very big uh, public health and public policy problem. There's a set of uh, laws around, uh, we've broadly described as sort of child safety or consumer safety. This includes things like design standards around guns uh, and then how guns are stored in the households. And a number of places have moved to regulate there. There's a set of laws around uh, sort of what can be done in public with guns. This is the so-called uh, you know, right to carry or concealed carry set of laws, open carry. Stand your ground laws, uh, what can uh, be done by a, uh, someone who has a gun in their hand when they're threatened or attacked, um, and uh, notoriously uh, guns on campuses, uh, a topic in some respects has brought us here today. Hardware and ammunition, um, uh, what types of guns can be sold, what types of ammunition can be sold, and then finally a sort of miscellaneous group of, of rules around crime prevention, how guns can be sold across state lines, whether guns must be identified in particular ways, they must, uh, and then some states have moved towards so-called ballistic uh, micro-stamping uh, design features that allow police to solve crimes when guns are used <coughs> in those crimes. So that's a kind of Cook's tour of the sort of main types of laws that, that exist out there. Um, uh, and now we go back to federalism. Uh, many of those laws, most of those laws, do not exist at the federal level. Uh, but they do exist uh, within some states. And what a particular state has um, is going to vary dramatically. Uh, a state like California uh, has many of those uh, laws that I previewed here. 
uh, as being a national leader in <coughs> implementing and formulating such laws. But other states like Virginia or Wyoming have virtually none of these. Uh, and so what regulates guns in those states is essentially the federal requirements. From an international point of view, the federal requirements are really very modest around what is required to buy and own a gun. And so we have this kind of <coughs> uh, qu patchwork quilt scheme of gun regulation in the United States that can't fully be understood until one looks and sees where one is uh, uh, in terms of state, but also locally. Uh, I didn't mention local gun laws. This has actually been a sort of boom industry over the last five years or so. Um, places like Sunnyvale have moved to regulate firearms. There's a, there's a uh, sort of continuing legal question around the, uh, whether they can do that or not, um, but a number of, of, of municipalities, cities around the country have moved to implement their own forms of uh, gun safety regulation. There are high levels of support for certain kinds of gun safety measures. And, and lower levels of support for others. Uh, when we look at uh, the survey data, and I apologise, this is a bit blurry. Uh, this is a Pew uh, survey that was done uh, a couple of years ago or a year ago. Um, and uh, the way to read this chart is, is uh, this is a, a sort of percentage spectrum here. Um, the green, blue is uh, gun owners' responses and the the sort of brown colour is, is non-gun owners, so we're splitting these responses out. And what you see right away is that there's surprisingly high levels of support among both gun owners and non-gun owners for certain measures. Uh, keeping guns out of the hands of the mentally ill, a robust background check system that includes private sales, and uh, the restriction of guns to uh, people who are on watch lists and no-fly lists and so forth. Um, also, uh, majority support among gun owners for, surprisingly, a federal database that would track gun sales, something that does not exist uh, today. Another uh, measure that there's uh, pretty broad support for is um, uh, a prohibition on uh, concealed carry weapons without a license. Um, more than 70% of gun owners and non-gun owners both agree with that. But then as we move down into some of these other measures, we start to see uh, the um, uh, agreement uh, dissipate. We have still strong uh, uh, support from non-gun owners, um, but gun owners uh, start to feel differently. Banning assault-style weapons, banning high-capacity magazines, allowing uh, concealed carry in, in more more places, um, uh, allowing teachers and officials to carry guns in K-12 to schools. Um, and now what's happened here is we're switching between gun owners and non-gun owners uh, on that chart. Uh, and so some of the general support for these propositions starts to, starts to dry up. <coughs> Another source of law in this area is, is judicial law. Uh, and uh, two very important, the, the two very important cases in, in this area over the last decade uh, came out of the Supreme Court. One in 2008, the Heller decision, and one in 2010, the McDonald decision. And for the first time in the history of the United States Supreme Court in 2008, uh, in a five to four decision, the Supreme Court said that the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution uh, permitted uh, uh, ownership um, of guns for certain lawful purposes. And that included a, a gun in the home for self-protection. It was actually quite a narrow decision, um, but it was momentous in the sense that uh, this much debated, much discussed uh, uh, right or purported right in the Constitution was recognised for the first time um, in the history of the United States. There'd been a lot of ambiguity around the Second Amendment, what it actually meant, whether it related to individuals or to um, so-called militias, which was uh, the term used in 1791 when the amendment was, was written. The McDonald decision, that was a decision out of uh, the District of Columbia, which is a federal enclave. It wasn't unclear whether that also applied to states and cities. And in 2010, the Supreme Court weighed in again and said that it did. Uh, that, that that decision, somewhat narrow decision, but nonetheless important decision, uh, applied uh, throughout the country. And so 
federal uh, state laws and local laws would be held uh, to that standard and would be judged uh, according to whether they interfered with that constitutionally protected right. These two decisions have launched a huge tidal wave of litigation across the country. Uh, today there are probably several hundred court cases proceeding through state and federal court challenging uh, certain restrictions on gun ownership and gun sales, invoking these two Supreme Court precedents. The Supreme Court has elected not to weigh in on this issue again, but many of us expect that when they do, the issue before them will be concealed carry. Heller only talked about guns in the home. Uh, some scholars have read into the Second Amendment uh, also a right to carry, uh, and it, the speculation is that the Supreme Court will at some point, um, particularly with its current uh, constitution, uh, consider that question. Another piece of uh, regulation that's important in this area is the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act, uh, which was enacted um, by the Bush administration in 2005. And this act conferred broad immunity on firearm and ammunition manufacturers and dealers. Uh, so when you hear about uh, litigation around school shootings and so forth, it's rarely against manufacturers um, because they uh, enjoy uh, what is um, really by legal standards a fairly stunning degree of protection uh, from the law. There's a complicated history behind this, this bill, um, but it's definitely uh, a very topical question, this protection, uh, and uh, nobody knows it better uh, than the Newtown families, the Sandy Hook families who have been pursuing an action against Remington um, in Connecticut uh, and have uh, been trying to uh, penetrate the um, PLCAA uh, in, in bringing their action. Uh, the, the cases against Remington and the, and the retailers and wholesalers of the weapon that was used um, in the Sandy Hook mass shooting. Uh, we're waiting any day now to hear from, the, the case has been thrown out by the lower court um, and it's been appealed to the Connecticut, Connecticut Supreme Court, so we're waiting to hear whether it will go forward. Um, it seems unlikely. Uh, the protections are broad and it's a fairly creative legal argument uh, that the families have made uh, to try to uh, push past the immunity uh, in this case. And then I guess I'll just sort of end um, on a note which, which to some people um, is joyous um, and I suspect to many in the room is, is not so joyous and that is that it's very unlikely that there will be any changes, any substantial changes uh, to federal firearm regulation in the foreseeable future. There is just not the appetite for that in, in, in Washington. I think we just have to look uh, in the news stories of the last two days to see how quickly the enthusiasm, um, including the President's enthusiasm uh, after Parkland has dissipated uh, and the uh, measures that are proposed uh, look very different to what was first discussed, um, have been watered down substantially and at this point look like simply a s strengthening of the background check system which means that uh, it becomes a, a federal crime to lie in your background check application, uh, something that many of us already thought was, was in place. Um, and then um, uh, uh, some training programs for teachers uh, who are uh, uh, gun uh, quote unquote experts uh, and will be able to take their weapons onto school campuses uh, to help protect their student bodies. So that's kind of where we are with um, um, gun safety regulation today and probably uh, I suspect we're likely to stay there uh, for the next uh, two years at least. So with that um, bright note I will <laughs> hand it over to Lee. David thanks so much. Um, uh, yes, on that bright note, actually, we'll be handing off to uh, Dr. Sandberg, uh, who, as I mentioned, is a fellow general pediatrician, is very engaged in physician-led advocacy uh, locally and nationally, um, and she'll tell you a little bit about uh, Moms Demand Action as well. So, Michelle? Thank you. No, where's the beginning? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Michelle Sandberg. I'm a pediatrician at Santa Clara Valley and I've worked with 
a number of you in our urgent care clinic, and I just want to reiterate our thanks for coming out today and for your interest in this topic. Um, I think like many people, I became interested in gun violence after the Sandy Hook shooting. My middle child was a first grader, and it hit really close to home for me. Um, I wanted to do something. I started educating myself about the gun violence problem. I was startled to learn the statistics. I was uh, startled that I didn't know them before and that they weren't sort of well-known information when it should have been. Um, and I started to get involved in a grassroots organization called Moms Demand Action. I'll tell you a little bit about them later. And I even did some of my first political lobbying, uh, met with some local Congress people um, to discuss gun safety legislation and went to D.C. to do some political lobbying for the first time. Um, really interesting experiences. I encourage anyone who's interested to get involved, and we'll talk more about that. But I would like to um, talk to you about the role of, of the physician. Um, so I believe um, for physicians, we have three roles, clinician, educator, and advocate. So we have a unique position with our patients as experts on health. Um, we can inform them of ways to prevent injury and death from firearms, such as discussing safe storage practices in our clinics. We're also educators, so we're responsible for educating residents and medical students, and I think we need to do a much better job teaching residents and medical students how to talk to their patients about guns, how to feel comfortable. There's definitely a lack of training in this area, um, so we could be doing a much better job there. And then obviously you've heard today about gun safety laws. Um, despite that, the sort of pessimistic note, which unfortunately I share, um, there are there are some some pro there is some progress at the state level, and we can be advocates for common sense gun safety laws that can save lives. So let's get into more detail. Um, what can we do specifically in our practices and in our clinics with patients? So pediatricians, I'm going to talk about pediatricians, but a lot of this applies to family practice, doctors, internists, ER docs, everyone. Um, pediatricians are advised to counsel their families that the safest home is a home without a firearm, safe storage and preventing access to guns reduces injury, and the presence of a gun in the home increases the risk for suicide among young adults. So again, this applies to internists, family practice doctors, ER doctors, and all physicians who should be counseling their patients about gun safety in the home. Now, it's recommended that guns be removed from homes where there's anyone with a mood disor dis disorder, substance abuse, or history of suicide attempt. And I'd like to note that several studies have shown that physician counseling results in increased safe storage in their patients. So there's not a lot of research in how doctors should discuss gun safety with their families. Um, there is a 2016 study published in the Journal of Pediatrics. Um, they surveyed families in the St. Louis area about their experiences and opinions with their pediatricians counseling them about gun safety. The majority of parents felt comfortable and wanted their physicians to discuss gun storage. Um, even among gun-owning families, they reported being opening being open to counseling about gun safety by their physicians. Um, and I, but I think we do need to note that doctors are considered health experts, not gun experts. So we need to approach this topic with our families from that perspective. So for instance, pediatricians are developmental experts. So it's often effective for us to approach this topic as an expert in development, saying things such as, children are naturally curious. If you tell them not to touch a gun, they are naturally curious and they will likely touch it anyway. Um, internists, family practice doctors are health experts, so we can counsel our families about gun safety the same way we counsel them about other safety issues. So not texting while driving, using your seatbelt in the car, wearing a helmet. Um, these are ways that we can effectively approach our patients. Firearm counseling should be non-ambiguous and non-judgmental. And firearms should be treated as other, as other avoidable household hazards, such as medications and poisons. So additionally, the American Academy of Pediatrics encourages physicians to educate their families about the ASK campaign. The ASK campaign is Asking Saves Kids. 
One question could save your child's life. Is there an unlocked gun where my child plays? So the Ask campaign encourages parents to ask and answer the question, is there a gun where your child plays? Now, about a third of, of houses in this country have guns. Many of them, unfortunately, are left unlocked and loaded. Um, just talking to a child about the dangers of firearms is not sufficient. Children are naturally curious. If there's a gun accessible in someone's home, there's a good chance a child will find it and play with it. And countless tragedies have occurred when kids have found guns that parents thought were well hidden or safely stored. So I'd like to also note that in a survey of the Ask campaign, 97% of parents who were gun owners themselves responded that they would not be offended if someone asked them about a gun in their home. So there was a recent study in 2011 that was commissioned by the Center for Prevention of Youth Violence. Um, in this study, 79% of respondents said they would be concerned if their child was going to a home that had a gun, but only 23% reported actually asking about this. 97% um, of parents, as I mentioned, who owned a gun said they would not be offended if they were asked about a gun in their home. So to raise awareness of this campaign, June 21st is National Ask Day, but if you're a healthcare provider, every day is Ask Day. Um, we should be educating our families about this Ask campaign to ask about guns in other people's homes and about the presence and storage of firearms in their own homes. So physicians can also be vocal advocates for gun safety legislation. There's multiple organizations um, we can lend our efforts to in advocating for common sense gun safety laws. I'll just go through a few. Um, you might have heard of some of these. Every Town for Gun Safety. There's a movement of more than four million mayors, parents, police officers, teachers, survivors. They're working together to end gun violence. Um, they, their efforts focus on um, helping elect pro-gun safety candidates, um, fighting bad legislation at the state level, promoting good common sense gun safety legislation at the state level, education and outreach about the gun violence epidemic. Um, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. This is the largest grassroots group working on this issue in the country. Um, it's inclusive of dads and any concerned citizen, and it's now under the Every Town for Gun Safety umbrella. Uh, Doc, Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence has been around a long time. Some of you might have heard of them. And Doctors for America, I'm not sure if we have any members here, but you might have seen their online campaign to end the ban on federal research of gun violence. Um, there's also many um, committees through the American Academy of Pediatrics that are working on the issue right now. Um, lastly, as I mentioned, when I first got involved in the issue, I had my first experience with lobbying. Um, there's easy ways to get involved. If you're moved to get involved in this issue when you leave this talk, the first thing I'd like to encourage you to do is start talking to your patients about guns in their homes. Um, the second thing I'd like to encourage you to do, check out some of these organizations. You can look at their websites. You can like their Facebook page. Um, there's really easy ways to get involved. They have action alerts. You can get texts to your cell phone that give you daily action items. And many of these are not time consuming. They're as easy as signing a petition, sending an email to your representative that's already written for you. Um, you're notified of local phone banks, local marches, local activities. So I would encourage you to get involved. And um, I think that a lot of us are not very optimistic about gun safety laws at the federal level, but at the state level, these advocacy organizations are doing really important work. So it's a combination of pushing back bad legislation and um, advocating for common sense gun laws at the state level. We've had a lot of success at the state level, so I'd encourage you guys to please get involved. Thank you so much to each of our panelists. If I can ask you guys to, to join us here at the table, now's the time for um, you, each of you to ask some questions of our of our panel. And I'm going to um, start by kicking it off about, uh, regarding 
gun violence research. So think about that in a moment. Um, uh, Dr. Sandberg talked about the role of healthcare providers as clinicians, as educators and advocates, and I would add to that also as uh, clinician scientists, which is a big uh, uh, emphasis here, of course, at Stanford. Um, and I'll, I'll start off with my own uh, perspective. As I mentioned before, I am conducting an NIH-funded randomized control trial of the AAP's injury prevention program. And we learned some from that. One was that um, about a third of um, infants live in homes with uh, guns in them. And parents will report that and they will, about two-thirds of them will report non-adherent behaviors to many of the things that Dr. Sandberg mentioned. And unfortunately, in our, C uh, in our randomized control trial, we're not able to pick up um, effects of the counseling recommended by the AAP on those, some of those reported behaviors. Um, nonetheless, um, you know, I guess my question for the panel is, first, what do we know from research uh, around clinician counseling, but also um, David and others' um, international comparisons of policies, but what is effective at reducing um, gun-related injuries? And what more do we need to do um, uh, with or without the Dickey Amendment to advance that research? So I'm going to pass this to you. And um, think about your questions. Just raise your hand. I think, David, you'll be, uh, Daniel, Dan is going to be going around to get other questions. So. I have some slides on Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in the um, comparison of the U.S. to other developed countries. So actually, I think I can, yeah, I can find some slides that might be useful here. Does someone else want to start first? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so... Okay. First of all, it's really hard to do these studies because even though every firearm-related death is is one too many, um, it's a rare event. Um, and so the challenge uh, in trying to understand the effects of different interventions is to generate enough power uh, to be able to uh, really get uh, significant outcomes. Um, we know from a few studies that um, the most widely supported um, uh, safety measure, uh, robust background checks, do seem to make a difference in terms of the incidence of firearm-related death, particularly suicide. Why suicide? Well, background check system generally comes with a waiting period, um, and as many of you know, suicide's an impulsive act, so just the exercise of going through that delay uh, when one's purchasing can make a big difference. So there was a study that came about four years ago in Missouri that looked at the rollback of that background check system in that state, and there was a, um, a not huge, but a significant um, uh, increase in firearm-related mortality associated with the dismantling of that background check system. So, I mean, that's um, so. so I, the reason I point to this particular study is because it was it was well done, but it's also the most widely supported um, intervention. Uh, and so, the confluence of sort of good evidence um, and uh, strong support, um, in many respects, makes it a very strong candidate for reform. I so have a couple of slides that we'll go through super quick because I think they're really interesting. If you want to get a sense of how the U.S. compares to other developed countries, um, I think these numbers are really startling. This is gun homicides. So Japan, less than 50. Britain, less than 60. Many countries in Europe, less than 150. Canada, less than 200. USA, more than 10,000. So you're 25 times more likely to be murdered by a gun in this country than in other developed countries. Um, this is homicides. You can see the U.S. over here. This is accidental firearm deaths. We also lead the developed world in that. Um, really quickly, because I think Australia is really instructive. Um, so in Australia, this was mentioned that in 1996, after the Port Arthur massacre, um, the National Agreement on Firearms was passed, and what this was was that it was a combination of laws. They stiffened licensing and ownership rules. They did a gun buyback program that bought back um, 650 assault, 650,000 assault weapons. Um, they basically banned automatic and semi-automatic assault rifles, and they now have 20 percent the murder rate of the U.S., half the robbery rate, no active mass shooting since, and. Of note, two things about this. Um, 
it's Australia used to be really similar to the U.S. In, some, in terms of gun culture. So a lot of people make the argument that there's such a prominent gun culture in this country, there's nothing we can do. Australia was very similar. Um, widespread availability of guns, prominent gun culture, and they really reduced their rate of gun deaths and reduced their mass shootings to zero. Um, I'd also like to note that there was no corresponding decrease in the rates of mental health during this time period. So when people like to say that, you know, mental health policies are the solution, um, I'm all for more access to mental health services. But unfortunately, um, for many people who are against gun safety laws, they like to talk about mental health as a distraction when other developed countries have the same rates of mental health as the U.S., but they have such lower levels of gun deaths because they don't have the widespread availability of guns. Um, I have other slides, but we won't get to them, but Israel, Brazil, these are also countries that have much stricter gun laws and have shown a decrease in their gun deaths, both in terms of homicides and suicides. Just to make a statement about the, um, as David alluded to, the impulse, like suicide is a function of impulsivity and access to lethal means. You need both of those things. The majority of people who commit suicide don't walk around suicidal 24-7. They actually decide within 24 hours of their attempt that they're going to do it. And oftentimes it's actually within an hour. And so if you hand someone something highly lethal in that moment of impulsivity, that's how you get a completed suicide. And um, if you look at the case fatality of shooting yourself, it's about 90%, as opposed to overdosing on pills, which is, I don't know, 2 to 5%. Um, and so I think that you need to, it, that's why it's so important to ask patients, because their access to lethal means um, is really what drives the, the completed suicide. Um, and just in terms of the role that the Dickey Amendment plays in funding, um, I actually learned about the Dickey Amendment only because as I was doing research with the trauma team, um, there was something that didn't make sense about how little there was present. And so as a student, I think there is actually a real opportunity here for us uh, to use other sources of funding as many medical students, um, undergrads, uh, kind of do research on their own. And I think very few are lucky enough to say that they actually have CDC funding. So if you can get other sources of funding and um, doing even basic research in this area where there really is just not much, there are tons of opportunities to learn a lot about this issue, um, kind of avoiding the Dickey Amendment issue altogether. And just one final note, I think you brought up a very important point about gun culture and this is something that, you know, I've seen is can even be a great source of pride uh, within the United States, uh, our, you know, strong sense of gun culture, but I don't think that argument uh, is enough and I think it's something that holds us back from learning from uh, neighboring countries, you know, including Australia. I myself am Canadian, um, you know, and these are very large uh, countries and continents uh, with, you know, varying um, ideologies about guns. There are certain provinces in Canada which uh, are much more liberal and larger, uh, you know, advocates of, uh, of uh, gun reform than others, uh, but it really boils down to strong federal legislation um, and, you know, the openness uh, that we should have within the United States to sort of learn from our neighboring uh, neighbors. I want to open the floor to questions. We have one over here. Thank you for coming and the organizers for putting this on. My name is Mark. I have a question um, regarded still to the mental health aspect of this. It seems to me that a lot of young males are the ones that are doing the school shootings, not exclusively, but it seems to me a lot of young males are doing this. And I'm just wondering if there's any research or work that's being done to look at young males and helping them uh, cope and deal with the, the frustration and anger that they have, um, and perhaps even at the school site, as unfair as that might be. But is there any re work in this regard to help young males work through this? I'll, um, I'll take a stab at this. So 
Um, I think some changes are there's been a focus on reporting, so trying to make it easier for families, parents, teachers to report um, disturbing behavior. And I think this relates to the Parkland shooting where there was a breakdown in the system. Um, this student was reported to law enforcement and the FBI and um, it wasn't followed up. I think one challenge here, one obstacle is that um, people have tried to identify the factors that will predict a mass shooter and there is no formula and it, it's incredibly hard to predict. So, you know, people who suffer from mental health problems are way more likely to be victims of violence than to be perpetrators of violence. Um, mental health in and of itself is not a great predictor. Um, a history of violence is a better predictor. Social isolation. So I think there's an attempt to try to, you know, identify these kids and adults in advance and it's been really hard. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's the, 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 the issue here is that there's sort of multiple strategies, right? One is to focus on the underlying mental illness and the other is to focus on, on, on means. And, you know, I think from, there's one message that comes through today. I hope it's that, you know, means really matter. Um, and th there are uh, one, one intervention that I didn't mention, um, which is actually gaining some um, notoriety at the moment, is the so-called GVRO, Gun Violence Restraining Order. California enacted um, this, this measure two years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, it's being evaluated at the moment by some colleagues at the University of California, Davis. And the idea here is that uh, family and friends or teachers can report certain individuals who they fear are at high risk of harming themselves or others. Uh, and the um, uh, and agents will, will remove the weapons. It's happened several hundred times in California already. Other states are interested in this. Um, but again, it's not treating them the mental condition, it's trying to um, uh, focus on the means and, the, and, and limit the, the possibility for, for injury and death. And, and Mark, one other program, uh, thanks to Iris Gibbs, the National Me uh, Medical Association came out with a big position paper last year and it included highlighting something called the interrupters model, which is um, an evidence-based model that might, might be of interest to you. Next question. Hi, I'm Julia. My question kind of relates a little bit to the program that was implemented in Australia, but thinking more locally, I think we talk a lot about gun buyback programs as an option, but if we do those things in isolation, we will right, potentially uh, increase the demand for weapons and things like that. Whereas in Australia, when it was done, lots of things were changed at the same time. So as we think about these kinds of programs and you know trying to get them into place, what are the potential consequences that we need to think of that may actually be negative? Yeah, Julia, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to disagree a little bit with my fellow panelists. I think the, the situation in Australia was very different. Um, the firearm ownership rates were a fraction of what they are in the United States. So when you buy back 650,000 weapons in Australia, you've made actually a substantial dent on the stock of weapons in the country. Um, that would be about the annual gun sales in the state of California, 650,000 weapons, handguns and long guns combined. So the stock is just enormous. Um, and while I think that buyback programs have some value, um, it's not a kind of substantial enough solution to the scale of the problem. Um, the value might actually be, Julia, more in kind of norm changing. You know, I, I think, you know, we tend to focus on sort of like, gun safety advocates and the NRA. But, you know, in the middle are, uh, you know, tens of millions of people who own weapons. And uh, my colleague John Donoghue refers to these as the sort of marginal gun owners, you know. So they, they have, a, they have a, a weapon in the home or several, and they do it because they think on balance it makes their families safer. Um, and the evidence is increasingly telling us that, that they're wrong about that. So to my mind, the most effective thing you could do is actually change their minds, uh, not implement gun control laws because that's not going to change their mind, but rather to engage in a process of norm changing where suddenly the feeling is that maybe that's not the best thing for the family, that on balance um, they aren't so far. And I think clinicians clearly have a role to play in that, uh, in that changing of hearts and minds. 
Yeah, I just want to um, agree that gun buyback programs in and of themselves have not been shown to be effective, has to be in combination with laws. And even individual laws are often not effective, so it has to be a combination. So background checks combined with child access prevention laws combined with gun buybacks, it's, it, it, there, all the data shows a combination is way more effective. Next question, I think, over here. Hi, I'm Maha. I, I was disturbed by um, listening to public radio report yesterday on uh, the NRA activities and a report on how um, gun companies are, are losing um, money these days because of the Trump election and people stopped being panicky about having to own guns so they didn't, the amount of buying of guns has dropped precipitously in the last year in Remington declared bankruptcy. But then they went on the report how the NRA and um, gun companies are encouraging schools to have programs such as ROTC and um, in um, maybe uh, uh, boys clubs to teach kids about guns. So basically it's like the uh, gun, uh, like the tobacco industry back in the 70s trying to reel in uh, fresh young meat for themselves. That's what they're doing now. And I think as pediatricians, this is what we have to fight nationally, is that kind of inculcation of the gun culture and brainwashing in our young people. Yeah, and um, I think back to what you were saying, um, I think in terms of changing hearts and minds, you know, there is data that a gun in your home is you're 22 times more likely to injure yourself or a family member than to use it in self-defense. I think a lot of people don't know this information and um, explaining this to families and gun owners, I think, is really important in terms of changing norms and and this this whole issue of getting the young, the next generation to have this love of guns that the older generation does. Um, Dr. Knowlton, I was just so impressed by your presentation. It's the kind of awareness that lasts way beyond lunch and dinner and uh, really grabs you and it just strikes me as what an impressive uh, intervention. That's an intervention, I mean, in terms of awareness and knowledge. And when we think about these events, sometimes it's, you say, well, geez, well, not in my backyard. But it is in our backyard and the potential is certainly there. And so for people to be aware, I mean, just parents, students, all of us to be aware to see some of these things and the impact of that. I thought that your work was wonderful and very motivating and I would hope that you could take that to PTAs and other groups because it was very powerful and thank you. I guess that's more of a statement than a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, just to sort of follow up on that, I mean, I, I think, you know, we as emergency physicians, trauma surgeons, we're only one part of the bigger process of intervention and certainly when people arrive at our doorstep we're able to provide uh, some degree of specialized care um, but you know there's been a substantial amount of literature that a lot of life-saving actions can actually help in the field and most of these people are not brought to the hospital uh, by ambulances they're uh, brought by individuals and that's really um, I alluded quickly at the end of the presentation to that stop the bleed campaign but uh, it's really about educating the public about what they can do helping bystanders whether it's uh, somebody who's bleeding after a motor vehicle accident on the side of the road or if we God forbid find ourselves in one of these situations of a mass shooting and it's obviously easier to treat somebody um, you know in a very controlled setting one patient who comes in and you have an entire team of people who are able to help them um, when it's a mass casualty event uh, you know you need to apply principles of triage who's most severely injured but also likely to survive and uh, that's the challenge and something that we need to think about as a medical community and a non-medical community about whether or not we're actually prepared for an event like that. Dana. First of all, thank all of you. It was an excellent panel with such a spectrum of different ways that we can get involved and empower families. Just wanted to tag on to what we can do in clinic with families in terms of asking about whether there's a gun in the home and then telling them how to safely store guns. And attending when I was a resident told me, 
after you've asked that question and you get a positive response and you talk about how to safely separate the guns and bullets and have them both separately locked up, is to ask the family to call you to tell you they have done that because so much of the advice that we'll give to families in clinic, they're getting a lot of different advice and then they're gonna go home and get back into their lives. So by having them actually remember to call you, it ensures that you'll hear that the family did it and it will just be a reminder to them to do that. And then if you don't get that phone call, you can follow up with the family. I just going to actually ask a, a question that was just texted to me by one of uh, the attendants who had to leave early, and that is there seems to be, you know, in our communities there are a lot of approaches to this uh, from those who believe in very strong gun control to those who believe very strongly in the Second Amendment. And in whatever communities we work with, our colleagues and our patients are going to have very diverse opinions. From the, some of the data, it looks like there are some things we can agree on. Um, the background checks, uh, the uh, banning weapons from individuals who are on the terrorist watch list, for example. Uh, and so the question he asks is, what can, what is the next step for us to do to foster the kind of dialogue we need to in order to help gain a better consensus to allow us to move forward, at least on the things that we can agree on? I mean, the, the short answer in my mind is research. I mean, we can, we can provide science that uh, will inform public policy. Yeah, I mean, I think it's messaging too. Like, you know, the reality is that the NRA and, and, and pro-gun groups have been streets ahead of um, the gun safety community for the last 20 years in terms of their messaging and the political influence that they wield. I mean, when you look at, like, I agree that we need more evidence, but if you look even just at the existing evidence and then public opinion, mm -hmm. it seems like a political no-brainer, but clearly it's not. Um, and we see that time and time again. So, you know, I think um, Every Town for Gun Safety and, uh, you know, the Gifford Centre and a number of these, uh, you know, they're, they're gathering momentum and they're bringing the expertise of sort of marketing and, and, and public outreach to bear on the problem. And But they've got a lot of ground to make up um, because the NRA is, is one of the most uh, powerful and clever, um, you know, lobbying organizations in the country. And I think that this isn't really a solution, just more of a statement, but I think it's, if you think about it, it's stunning that something like background checks has 90% public support and 87, 87% public support among gun owners, and yet we've been unable to pass universal background checks. I can't think of any other issue that has 90% support that you can't pass legislation on. So that's not really a, a discussion of the solution, but I think it's pretty mind-boggling fact. Well, we also have to make it harder to do nothing. Um, than to do something, right? So right now it's easier to just do nothing. Politicians don't feel the heat and so if we vote and we make it more uncomfortable for them to do nothing, then then you'll see this change. I mean, the, the, the first few congressmen you see who, who have like allied themselves with the NRA and have a A plus rating who get voted out of office along this issue, if people go out and vote and say, I voted you out of office because of your record, you'll start to see people distance themselves from the NRA and then, you know, you get enough people who will say, let's, let's if there's 90% support, let's do it. There's a question over there. So, I'm okay, Gabe, thanks for this panel. I, may, I arrived late and you may have talked about this, but it's about messaging. Is there enough, is there data on urban rural differences and how gun violence affects different communities? Because in some ways, messaging has to be targeted and if you don't understand the audience that you want to reach, it's very difficult to, to do that. That's a question that I had. So are there data in which gun violence, that tell us how gun violence plays out in different communities, particularly along the urban rural areas? I mean, we know something about ownership, right, which is really, really yes. important. So it's important to separate handguns and long guns. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, handguns are guns of urban areas and long guns, are, sorry, Lee, um, uh, are, are guns of, of, of rural areas. And when it comes to sort of the public health problem, three quarters of gun-related homicides where we know the weapon, three quarters of gun-related suicides where we know the weapon, it's a handgun. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I, I don't have an answer to your question because I don't think we know exactly, but, but in terms of how we would frame the message to those two audiences, it's a very different message. Um, and 
Um, I think we need to be aware, my dentist was telling me yesterday, who's here in the audience, that, that the understanding gun type and differences in gun type and why people buy weapons and, and, and geographic differences is extremely important uh, in terms of shaping, shaping messages and also, frankly, shaping the, what we know from research. Because uh, it's not, you know, the gun violence epidemic, I like to say, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a single epidemic. It's a series of micro epidemics, um, and we saw that in some of the presentations today, and, and they need to be sort of taken in, 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 in context. And in terms of the information that's known, um, there are certain data sets that do carry information exactly along the lines of what you're talking about with um, breaking down gun injuries by location, by race, um, and it does really get back to one of the issues about the number. Um, so while this is a huge problem economically, socially in this country, the sheer number of them, um, when you break down the uh, incidents into those numbers, gets a little small. Surprisingly, and so it is difficult to maybe adequately come up with research that might show um, the differences between urban and rural um, kind of firearm injuries. But I do think it gets to a really important point, um, which you touched on earlier, which is that these injuries are very different for different populations based on race, based on location. Um, and so if there were more kind of vast data sets that track this information, you might be able to make a huge amount of headway in terms of how you prevent those issues. Because um, given how different they are, Prevention might mean something totally different for uh, someone who's black in an uh, urban environment and someone who's white in a rural environment. Uh, hi, my name is Robin. Thank you very much for this. It's very helpful. Um, I've been arming myself with information because I started out sort of arguing uh, against guns without knowing much and got my my uh, head handed to me. So I became more knowledgeable and I found along with knowledge, it's very helpful to maintain civility <laughs> in arguing with people who are clutching their guns so close to their chest. And I had two conversations with younger family members who completely turned around because I just refused to, to judge them or to be angry with them because they were family members. And so now they're advocating. They didn't even know that California had such strong um, gun control. And when they found that out, they were no longer threatened because they still had their guns. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they quickly turned around to supporting the same thing that we have in California to everywhere else, but not more in California. So there's work to be done. But all this to say, I would love to have copies of the slides that you feel comfortable giving out if those can be made available just to, to help. And also any um, sites, I know that CDC and other sites. Um, so this, this session is being videotaped. Perfect. Live stream. We will publish a link um, once we figure out where it's going to be posted, so you will have the ability to show this to anybody. Who needs this. Great, and any links that you find yeah. helpful for information. Thank you. He also. Maybe one more question from Dr. Kersentai, and then we will break so that the students who wish to do the walkout can well, I wanted to thank the panel as well for all of your insights, but the question I had was, you know, one can get discouraged when you look at the federal laws and, and the lobbying that, that uh, seems to defeat any significant effort to make progressive changes, but California has been on the vanguard of air quality improvement and uh, smoking and public uh, laws, and why can't we continue to upgrade our gun safety laws in the state of California to be on the vanguard of that movement as well? And if, if so, the, it's a legal question, is there the concern that there would be Second Amendment infringements or such that would be brought against California, or do you think we have the ability to act with relative impunity to improve our, our laws. And also, just one other thing, I think if you took your presentation that was so graphic and, and uh, uh, shocked and awed many of us in this room to the state legislature, if we had an, a meeting where those slides were shown, where the OR after a resuscitation, actually the uh, trauma bay in the ER after resuscitation was shown to a policymaker group, it would have enormous impact. And we need, I think, emotional content like that so you don't think of a gun as an isolated object that is 
uh, not associated with the kind of horror that you showed in those slides. So that, that would be the kind of lobbying campaign that perhaps could happen on the state level that perhaps would build more consensus around this, starting with blue states and hoping to move over to more red states as, as the movement were to make some progress. But your thoughts about the legal aspect? Yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is that California is already doing that. Um, there is, um, uh, there are, there are gun safety measures being enacted each year, um, and there are, um, there are new and different ones coming all the time, such as the GVROs, I think is a good example, um, bans on certain forms of ammunition that were introduced in 2015. Um, California's not alone. There are several other states that are also in the vanguard here. Um, so I, I, I think that, that you know, the states can be the laboratory and, and, and are in some respects, but, but I don't think that there's an easy transition to, to, to federal law there. You know, when I think about the environmental um, example, I don't think it was law leading that shift from California's vanguard position to the federal, um, you know, Clean Air Act and so on. What was leading it was, was, was fundamental changes in people's attitudes to the environment and to pollution. Um, there was norm shifting happening underneath and by the time the, the, the country was ready for a substantial change, they had California with a series of off the shelf kind of uh, uh, legal and policy solutions that could be adopted federally. So, you know, it doesn't help my business to say this, but I think the law lags in this area, what people are ready to accept. And in California, um, they're ready to accept a lot more than people in um, Wyoming or uh, in Virginia. Um, so I think that's likely to be true um, uh, for the foreseeable future. Hey, I, I don't want to necessarily cut this discussion um, short, but we do need to finish up. Dr. Smith Coggins has a brief announcement. We have one other brief announcement, and then I'll allow Lee to make some fi final comments. Thank you. I just want to um, call attention to the, the Dr. For America is, um, camp, has this campaign for today that um, any of you who are physicians if you can find a student or two, you write the student's name up at the top and your name at the bottom, take a photo of the two of you, and it says, please excuse blank for being absent from class to advocate for ending gun violence. Um, so, and then if you want to just uh, email it to SOM Wellness, so School of Medicine Wellness at stanford.edu, and we'll, we'll post it in the appropriate place. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mario. I'm here on behalf of Supervisor Dave Cortese at the County of Santa Clara Board of Supervisors. I just wanted to invite the public to our gun safety summit that we're going to be having on either April 20th or the 21st. Uh, we're still trying to uh, solidify the date. Uh, but it's essentially uh, for the community from different um, multidisciplinary background uh, stakeholders like yourself, the medical community, to come and meet with us and to discuss discuss and have a dialogue on how we as a county can move forward on some of these prevention efforts. And I think uh, one of the biggest things that I've been hearing a lot is the focus on mental health, but uh, someone mentioned the history of violence as also a predictor. And from the medical community, it would be really helpful for us to know how we can assist uh, victims of domestic violence and intimate partner violence because they're also uh, one of the highly uh, visible community members that need additional assistance as well. So uh, I can definitely send out the information and you can uh, distribute it to your colleagues, and uh, we hope to see some of you there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before we close here, I think all of us have been inspired by the voices of youth uh, in the past month, uh, high school students. Um, I hope that we accomplished one of our aims here, which is how healthcare providers can speak with a consolidated voice. I think what Dr. Smith Coggins just referenced is one way to do that. Dr. Gesundheit, I think one way that we can think about this is moving this conversation forward. We didn't want this to be a one and done event. This is the beginning of a conversation and um, Sarah Beth and I are happy to take other recommendations about how healthcare providers across the spectrum, not just physicians, nurses and, and others, can speak with a consolidated voice to this issue. So finally, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel members for sharing their time. And I think we've, we've ended just in time for those who want, who want to join the, the walkout. Um, thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.